we want to, uh, uh, we thought since we're supposed to start at 6.30, I could offer a, a, a brief homily here at the beginning to put everybody to sleep before the, uh, the main event. Just kidding. Welcome everyone to the offices of First Things Magazine. For those of you who don't know about First Things, <laughs> that should be an empty set. Um, but for those of you who don't subscribe to First Things, that may not be an empty set. I could say that uh, subscription to First Things is a sign of superior intelligence. And I could tell that everyone in this room wants to be thought to be among the, the elect. So please, uh, please subscribe to First Things Magazine. It's one of the leading, no, it's the leading uh, <laughs> journal of religion, culture, and public life. Yes? Uh, just a brief mathematical correction. The, the empty set, there's only one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, it's really, it's my pleasure to be able to, to, um, to partner with the National Association of Scholars uh, that has been doing good work uh, to, to fight the good fight for academic excellence and academic integrity in our um, university system for now it must be two decades and maybe even longer than that. I remember when Steve Balch came to Omaha, Nebraska, where I was a young faculty member, to try to convince me to run the Nebraska section of the National Association of Scholars. And <laughs> I told him, no way. <laughs> but uh, but I, I'm very grateful for the, um, for the work that the National Association of Scholars has done, not the least of which has been to stand up for academic freedom in, in the fraught uh, context where when I left academia in 2010, I thought things couldn't get worse. And boy, was I mistaken in that regard. Uh, so. Without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Peter Wood, and Peter will, will introduce um, our, our speaker and awardee for the evening, Amy Wax. Thank you, Rusty, and um, that uh, position in Nebraska is still open. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very grateful to First Things, which has hosted a number of NAS events, um, all of which have gone swimmingly well. Uh, this is an unusual one for us, uh, and I'm going to take a few minutes to explain exactly what goes on here. I'm going to be presenting an award to uh, Amy Wax, the Peter Shaw Memorial Award, in a few minutes. Uh, I think I need to explain what that award is. At the time of his death in uh, 1995, at age 58, Peter Shaw was the chairman of the National Association of Scholars. He'd been a professor of English at uh, SUNY Stony Brook from 1965 to 1980, at which time his career was cut short by a heart attack. He returned to teaching part-time um, at several local colleges, but he really found his second vocation in helping to found what uh, would eventually become the National Association of Scholars. It was a movement aimed at revitalizing intellectual inquiry, the liberal arts, and academic freedom in American higher education, and you are all either current or future members of this <laughs> movement. Uh, <laughs> Peter was one of the, the small group of people at the beginning with Steve Balsh and Herb London, who founded it as a working group in 1982, it was officially incorporated in <coughs> 1987, which answers Rusty's question, we're 31 years old. Um, Peter Shaw took his undergraduate degree from Bard College, his doctorate in English and comparative literature from Columbia. He wrote books on President John Adams, on the American Revolution, and his concerns about what was happening in the universities at that time. He spent the last 15 years of his life concerned about mortality his own and the tradition of rational inquiry that is at the heart of scholarship. Uh, he was, as his NAS colleague Stanford Pinsker observed in a tribute after his death, uh, a man of tenuous health who, knowing his condition, comported himself with a style and humanity 
that did honor to Hemingway's words, grace under pressure. Now, some of that grace was evident in his shaping of the National Association of Scholars journal, Academic Questions, from its debut in 1987 until his death in 1995. Now, I never had the pleasure of meeting Peter Shaw, but his handiwork in founding that journal and editing it and writing for it over those uh, 10 years or so changed my life. From its inaugural issue on academic questions taught me that the ideological orthodoxies of my discipline, which happens to be anthropology, and the university as a whole could in fact be questioned. The journal projected a voice not of raucous indignation, but quiet and respectful authority, even when it was reporting on the outrageous departures from the traditional decorum of scholarship, with which I think we are all now familiar. I had just read Alan Bloom's Closing in the American Mind, published the same year as that inaugural issue of Academic Questions. Uh, Bloom's uh, quirky iconoclasm, his scathing critique of cultural relativism, touched mostly down in the realm of philosophy departments, but it raised questions about where else this could go and wondering how that skepticism could be applied or could flourish elsewhere in the academy, I found my answer from Peter Shaw in the only mildly paradoxical form of a journal titled Academic Questions. His idea was to permit questions that other people were insisting could not or should not be asked, and perhaps to insist on the importance of asking those questions. He had no doctrine of his own other than to, again, quoting his, his colleague Stanford Pinsker, freewheeling discussion, openness to liberal learning, and a particular delight in exposing the shoddy scholarship and spacious <laughs> logic that often traveled under the wide banner of political correctness. That seems particularly apropos this evening. After Peter's death, the National Association of Scholars established a memorial fund to support an award in his name, officially for the purpose of honoring scholars who have made signal contributions to academic freedom. Now on this occasion, we have tweaked that purpose ever so slightly. Rusty Reno suggested that we amend it in the case of Professor Wax from academic freedom to academic courage. I trust the aptness of that alteration doesn't require much explanation. Academic freedom unused is a dead letter or perhaps it's a linoleum floor across which many feet travel to no great end, or perhaps in circles. For academic freedom to mean something, it needs the added ingredient of courage, willingness to stand up to those who attempt to enforce conformity, and silence is never easy. Outsiders who don't know better sometimes think that tenure obviates the need for courage. The tenured professor can speak his mind in perfect security. But no, that's not how things really work. The tenured professor can be fired for concocted reasons, as recently happened to Professor McAdams at Marquette University. The tenured professor can be hounded to the wall by relentless administrators determined to silence a dissenter from feminist orthodoxy, as is happening right now to Professor Dennis Gowes at Springfield College. The tenured professor can find his peer-reviewed article erased from a journal when the publisher caves in to death threats against the editor, as happened to Professor Bruce Gilley at Portland State University. The tenured professor can be mobbed on the quad and left to fend for himself until he resigns, as happened to Professor Nicholas Christakis at Yale University. The tenured professor can find his administration cavalierly unconcerned when his class is swarmed by thugs who threaten bodily harm until the professor resigns, as happened to Professor Brett Weinstein at Evergreen State College. This partial, very partial, roll call is necessary to understand the significance of Professor Amy Wax's actions since August of last year. Professor Wax has been called to account for a newspaper op-ed praising bourgeois values, and more recently for saying in an interview with Glenn Lowry 
in September of 2017 that she did not think that any black students had graduated in the top quarter of the University of Pennsylvania Law School during her time there. Now, if you were here this evening, it probably means that you already know this, but in the event that you've just happened to wander into the room and are not quite sure what has happened, um, let me give a, a little bit more synopsis. Uh, professor Wax is a chaired professor at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Among her responsibilities, she teaches the required first year uh, course in civil procedure. Last August, she co-authored an article in the Philadelphia Inquirer in which she argued that allegiance to bourgeois values, things such as uh, uh, getting married before having children, would go a long way towards improving the lives of young people. This was taken as a racial insult by some students, and a hue and cry went up at Penn Law School to sanction Professor Wax for her opinion, not only among students, but about half her colleagues as well joined in. Her dean, in spirit, sided with the protesters, but he couldn't find any good grounds for punishing her. Some of the protesters, stung by their lack of success, put their heads down, went back to work to find something more incriminating. And they think, they thought, they found it when they discovered a recording of the uh, Glenn Show, a podcast, from September 10th, 2017, in which Brown University professor Glenn Lowry interviewed Professor Wax, not for the first or last time. At 46 minutes into this interview, you see they did their homework, Professor Lowry <laughs> brings up the problems of those black students admitted to academic programs. I've just lost my identity. That happens to us <laughs> entirely. You can make it up whatever. What the first thing sign on it. It's a trans. It's a trans. Okay. okay. Um, he asked her about uh, those academic programs that have preferential treatment for black students, those students who have, in his words, less impressive academic credentials find themselves in a context through maybe no fault of their own. He asked, what happens when you are looking at that kid in the face and the kid is saying to you, are you saying we're unqualified and we don't deserve to be here? What, asked Glenn, how do you deal with that? Well, Professor Wax answers that she tries to avoid the subject when she can, but when she must, she addresses it by saying something like this to the students. Look, on average, you are less qualified in terms of your ability to compete on these narrow sets of skills that we value in academia for functional reasons. Uh, Amy Wax explains that the meritocracy that she's talking about is not a moral good, but a functional good. These are things you have to know in order to succeed in the field you're choosing to go into. But then she tries to explain what she calls the downside of affirmative action, which consists of taking perfectly capable kids, her phrase, and putting them in a program in which they are over their heads. Then comes the sentence that occasions all the trouble that has followed. In reference to the Penn Law School, quote, I don't think I've ever seen a black student graduate in the top quarter and rarely, rarely in the top half. I should add that Professor Wax observed this in a tone of regret as one who wished better for those students who she saw as victims of a mismatch and well-intentioned but dysfunctional admissions policies. During the first weeks of March 2008, however, some students at the school citing this sentence circulated an online petition calling on their school to ban Professor Wax from teaching those first year law students and to take other actions against her, like getting her off various committees, but especially uh, a demand that the school officially declare that Professor Wax's statement was false. It didn't take very long. It was on March 13th, the law dean, Ted Ruger, capitulated to the petitioners on their primary demand and their demand for several other punishments. Dean Ruger, however, presented his repudiation of the accuracy of Professor Wax's observation in an oddly evasive manner. He didn't deny its accuracy. Instead, he said, 
it is imperative to state that Professor Wax's claims are false. Now think about that. <laughs> That's pretty far from saying that Professor Wax's statements are actually false. It's imperative that the actor playing Hamlet act like he has stabbed Polonius. But the actor who plays Polonius gets up at the end of the scene and walks off stage stabless. Now, that appears to be the drama playing out at Penn Law. No one to date has come up, so far as I know, with an instance that vitiates Professor Wax's observation. In anticipation of that absence, the petitioners created a straw man to the effect that merely talking about the subject without mentioning anybody in particular is, I'll quote, in clear violation of the terms and spirit of Penn Law's anonymous grading policy and compromises the law school's assurance that grades are maintained by the registrar under strict scrutiny. Interesting Supreme Court phrase there. Professor Wax plainly did not violate any student's confidentiality. She had, had and still has the right to speak about the issues that Glenn Lowry raised. And as far as we can tell, she told the truth about the academic performance of black students at the law school. If she is in error, which is possible, it would be a very minor error since a plain factual refutation would have been forthcoming by this point. The attack from the bushes of anonymous grading policy is merely an effort to circumvent the pertinent facts which seem to vindicate Professor Wax. Now, we're not alone in observing this at NAS. Brooklyn College professor Robert Cherry, citing data from the Law School Admissions Council, wrote to much the same effect in a published letter uh, to the editor of the Daily Pennsylvanian, the student newspaper at Penn. The consequences of Dean Ruger's treatment of Professor Wax had begun to multiply. University of Pennsylvania Board of Trustees member and member of the Law School's Board of Overseers, Paul Levy, who I believe is here tonight. Levy? Don't, don't, Levy? Levy, thank you. Um, on April 6, resigned both positions in a letter to Penn's president, Amy Gutman, in his letter, Mr. <coughs> Levy cited the university's treatment of Amy Wax as unacceptable. In this sense, the actions taken by Dean Ruger are burning through the moral, intellectual, and because Mr. Levy was a major donor, the literal capital of the law school and the university. Maintaining the fiction of racial justice while practicing policies that are manifestly unjust, however, is presumably the settled policy of Penn, as it is of many other colleges and universities, and we should not expect a sudden awakening of conscience on the parts of either Dean Ruger or President Gutman. They are <coughs> both settled on the path of obfuscation and prevarication as a way of papering over the reality that racial preferences hurt the supposed beneficiaries. Now that's the play. The petitioners having carried their initial points with Dean Ruger, have now upped the ante by calling for Professor Wax's firing from her tenured position. Now to the business at hand. Amy Wax, Robert Mundheim Professor of Law at the University of Pennsylvania, Yale graduate, Harvard Medical School MD, Columbia JD, expert on social welfare policy, renowned teacher of civil procedure, author of Race, Wrongs, and Remedies, Group Justice in the 21st Century, as well as countless scholarly articles in law reviews and academic journals. The National Association of Scholars takes this occasion to recognize your remarkable service to American higher education. You've stood tall against the gale force winds of demagogy that now blow through the academy. You have spoken truth without fear or favor when others have cowered. You have braved the calumnies of those who, unable to answer your arguments, have resorted to unrelenting personal attack. Under fire, you have neither retreated nor flinched, but walked calmly forward. Nor have you given in to the temptation to answer vituperation with more vituperation, but instead modeled for all to see 
how a calm demeanor deflects the arrows and blunts the swords of those who would replace civil debate with menace and intimidation. However shallow the safeguards may be to the standards they are pledged to uphold, the administrators of the universities are unable to touch you. However fearful, honest colleagues may be as they sense the fanaticism of the mob, you have shown that clarity of purpose for which there is only one proper word and that word is courage. I speak of moral courage, but not only of moral courage. We've seen often enough that the threats of those who defy the prescriptions of the social justice enforcers can lead to physical violence. Professor Amy Wax, in recognition of your words and actions, not only during the academic year just past, but over your career as a teacher and scholar, unafraid to speak the truth in times and places where it pays to fall silent or to temporize, the National Association of Scholars proudly bestows on you the Peter Shaw Memorial Award for Academic Courage. We present you with this handsome plaque. <laughs> and with this check for $5,000. <laughs> well, I am grateful and honored to receive the Peter Shaw Memorial Award from the National Association of Scholars, an organization I have been proudly associated with for some time. I do confess some dismay at receiving an award for academic courage, Current shouldn't be necessary for anything I have said or done, but unfortunately in the academy today it is. I'm going to begin with a very brief account of my recent experiences at Penn Law, and even briefer because Peter has touched on some of the highlights. And then I will draw some broader lessons from that experience for the future of the academy and society as a whole. And I will try to keep this short enough to have lots of times for questions because Q&A is always the best part. My saga, as Peter says, began on August 9th of last year when I published an op-ed with a co-author, Larry Alexander, about paying the price for the breakdown of the country's bourgeois culture. The piece touted a renewed embrace of bourgeois values, a revival of the well-worn cultural script for mature adulthood that had prevailed before the 1960s. And in what became the most controversial passage, we pointed out that cultures are not equal. Some are more successful than others in preparing people to be productive citizens in a modern technological society. In an interview the next day for the school newspaper, I defended that assertion. I used the phrase, some cultures are cult functionally superior by pointing to how people vote with their feet. I noted that global migrants flock to white European countries. They don't risk their lives in rickety boats to go to Venezuela or Zimbabwe. <laughs> Our peace created an immediate firestorm. Petitions from groups at Penn and elsewhere labeled me a racist, a white supremacist, xenophobe, hater, and the familiar litany. Some colleagues criticized the praise of the 1950s, arguing that the shortcomings, which we acknowledged, rendered the whole period irredeemably evil. A flimsy argument, but at least an argument. But not long after, as Peter said, 33 of my colleagues signed an open letter condemning me and categorically rejecting all my views, but made no argument or justification for that. One colleague told me angrily that I had ruined his summer because of the op-ed. I had inflicted damage on the students and the faculty. I ran into him on the street. He stormed away. Another said the open letter was necessary to get my attention so I wouldn't write anything like that again. And last December, my own dean asked me to take a leave next year to stop teaching my mandatory procedure course, citing pressure to banish me from Penn Law and expressing hope that my going away would quell the controversy. I refused. When I reported our conversation in a Wall Street Journal piece last February, he immediately denied that he had asked me to leave for the reasons stated. 
Dear listener, I assure you he had. <laughs> and then he sent me an irate email from his iPhone, I don't even have an iPhone, stating, you're lying, Amy. Direct quote. These events show how key rules of the road for academic discourse, rules like engaging in civil debate, giving reason justifications, not calling names or using slurs, and being honest and forthright, are routinely violated in my institution as they are increasingly at others. All in all, these incidents display an attitude that is unwelcoming to dissent, to say the least. And who is responsible for this? Overwhelmingly, it is the progressive left which dominates the academy today. Increasingly, power and politics determine who gets to speak and who is excluded, which ideas are penalized and which not. In today's climate, universities have devolved into a potent mix of politics and religion, which, as Jonathan Haidt says, means that we are closer to a world in which academic disagreements are resolved by social force and power not by argument and persuasion. Which brings me to the denouement of my story, which is pertinent to the announced theme of my talk. The cost of the growing progressive <coughs> insistence on equality defined as equality of outcomes, and especially group outcomes. I submit that that insistence, which is central to the obsession with identity, diversity, and inclusion that now pervades our society, threatens the core of the academic enterprise and the disinterested search for truth, and indeed casts a pall of orthodoxy on thought and speech in all areas of our society dominated elites, which are many, the media, the workplace, the professions, big business, and the entertainment industry. As David Azarad of the Heritage Society has observed, this imperative for equal results requires all right-thinking people to, quote, denounce the mistreatment of designated groups at the hands of an unjust society and to praise their accomplishments, whether real or fake, genuine or fabricated. Those who venture beyond this safe space do so at their peril. The accuracy of his words was recently brought home to me when student activists, as Peter said, the Black Law Students Association, unearthed this podcast I made at Glenn Lowry's behest. I made a number of points there. We had a far-ranging discussion. But then I did say that as far as I recalled, I had not seen black law students graduate in the top of the class. I immediately added, however, that I was drawing on my experience <coughs> teaching a large first-year class. And in truth, I was also thinking of my service <coughs> on the clerkship committee where I was privy to data on student rankings. I also said that I did not have the full picture because the performance of minority students is a quote, closely guarded secret at Penn Law, and it is. And I went on to speculate that it could prove an uphill battle for students who are so overmatched to pursue a law degree. Once again, a media blitz, a renewed campaign of student demands to remove me from teaching a mandatory first year class. But this time the dean acquiesced. He announced his decision in a lengthy email to the entire Penn Law community. Now, I believe it is instructive to contemplate that message, what it said and what it did not say. He claimed that my assertions, which he mischaracterized in a number of ways, were inaccurate, even false, but in a typical catch-22. As Peter says, he offered no data to back it up. He said I had violated confidentiality, but cited no authority for this, and he is a lawyer after all. Most tellingly for our purposes, though, he speculated that black students assigned to my class, quote, may reasonably wonder whether their professor has already come to a conclusion about their presence, performance, and potential for success. And therefore, they may legitimately question whether the inaccurate and belittling statements may adversely affect their learning environment and career prospects. The assertion I want to hone in on here is that the belittling <clears throat> statements I made about black students, which he insisted were inaccurately, quote, adversely affect the learning environment. What does that mean? How do we gauge such effects? Do minority students in my class learn less or in lower grades than in other classes? 
Any claim that I deliberately downgrade minority students is a non-starter. First year grading is blind. Maybe my presence in the classroom impedes learning. But then minority students should do worse in my procedure class than others in other first year courses. Something that can be easily verified by looking at the numbers. But so far, there has been no effort whatsoever to investigate. And I predict no effort will be made because I submit that the facts are beside the point. The beauty of the allegations about student learning in my classroom is that the facts don't matter. Rather, what matters is perceptions and feelings. Professors who hold unpopular views or state inconvenient facts, true or false it would seem, are psychologically toxic. In their presence, if their presence causes offense, distress, disparagement, feelings of insult, fears of ill treatment, that is enough. No student should be forced to take their class or learn from them. These perceptions and feelings are subjective, self-confirming, and thus immune to challenge. It's all in the mind of the beholder, and the beholder's mind reigns supreme. Now, what's wrong with this? As Glenn Lowry eloquently pointed out in defending me against my dean's decision, allowing student discomfort to determine whether a teacher gets to teach amounts to a weapon of mass destruction. <laughs> An all-purpose device for penalizing professors who hold unorthodox views or discuss distressing realities. The possible scenarios are endless. That is the possible scenarios of objections based on hurt, discomfort, or disparagement. They can be concocted out of a host of observations or positions. Glenn Lowry gives the example of some groups performing better than others, of reporting that Asians tend to excel in his class, which he says they do, or that a professor supports Trump, or she believes that colonialism was sometimes a positive good, or that women are less interested in science than men, or that illegals should be deported. I recently considered assigning a chapter from Charles Murray's Human Accomplishment, which shows that men are responsible for almost all the great technical advances of <coughs> mankind. One can imagine women students feeling <coughs> belittled by that, and offended, our teacher thinks women can't be geniuses, we feel uncomfortable, we can't learn in her class, and out she goes. The decision to indulge this reaction, these reactions, knows no limits, and is especially pernicious in assuming away professionalism, that professors are unable to separate their political or scholarly positions from classroom conduct or relationships. Now, what does all this have to do with equality of results, the announced topic of my talk? The rhetoric of hurt and insult, of psychological discomfort and trauma that impedes learning or functioning is routinely deployed to advance the cause of egalitarian identity politics, as it was in my case. Ideas about group differences and awkward facts about possible sources of those differences must be suppressed, denied, and banned unless they fit the dominant narrative, which is that ours is an irredeemably racist and sexist society, and all group disparities flow from nefarious discrimination. Correct thinking on racial preferences is even more baroque and self-contradictory. All people, all virtuous people, accept that affirmative action is good and necessary. But the academic gaps that make it necessary, although sometimes glaringly obvious, may not be mentioned in polite company, or they are illusory, or the product of racism, or amenable to instant correction through the offices of preferences, services, programs, and initiatives without end. Indeed, central to the practice of affirmative action is a tenacious myth, myth which I have elsewhere dubbed the central myth of affirmative action, which is that beneficiaries arrive at their institution, once they arrive at their institution of higher learning, they will instantly catch up. Any suggestion that the myth is just that, and that performance gaps persist, is reconfigured as an attack on minority students, an assertion of their inferiority, or that they don't belong here, or that their professor thinks less of them, all charges that will lever against me. These disparagements cause hurt and must be penalized. 
Now, in the climate that prevails in the university as well as many workplaces, this set of rhetorical moves amounts to the position that affirmative ac ac action can neither be evaluated nor questioned. It must be accepted. It's part of a broader pattern that has taken over on many fronts. Unequal outcomes must be ignored, denied, or eliminated. And if they are acknowledged, no explanation other than racism is acceptable. Group differences in academic performance, workplace success, rates of school discipline, wealth, home ownership, credit, and lending, the list goes on, can never be attributed to anything victims do or choose, certainly not to anything the individual can control. Information about supply side explanations about how people actually behave or perform must be ignored or suppressed, and people who talk about these things marginalized and neutralized. And of course, examples are everywhere. Heather McDonald recently noted that patterns of school discipline, higher rates of discipline for minority boys, must not be attributed to gaps in rates of offending, even though there's good evidence they exist. Rather, they must be attributed to racism, unfair treatment, discrimination. In lending and home mortgages, Unfavorable terms for minorities must likewise be attributed to discrimination and never to factors like spending patterns or credit scores, although there's some data showing that these do vary by group and they make a difference. Which brings us back to affirmative action and how we're allowed to talk about it. The irony here is that like a good conservative, I actually think that private institutions should be allowed to adopt any admission policy they want and let the chips fall where they may. But the problem is that the chips are never allowed to fall where they may. The hopes for group equality that grow out of affirmative action and similar programs do not stop at the schoolhouse door. They feed into elaborate taboos, charades, and untruths that pervade society and affect what we all can think, say, and notice. As I wrote recently in the Wall Street Journal, when well-meaning policies don't work as billed or produce the equal results that are promised, <coughs> resentment, disappointment, and recrimination ensue. Someone must be blamed, and that someone is us, those who live, work, and operate in the real world and take on the thankless task of maintaining some semblance of a meritocracy for everybody's benefit. And though we would like to defend ourselves from this charge of racism, the all-purpose explanation for so many social ills, we find our way blocked when group differences in performance and behavior cannot be mentioned and must be denied. Instead, we must profess, at least outwardly, although not always in private, that racism and white privilege pervade every corner of our society. By requiring us to tell untruths on pain of social death, this regime is humiliating and unfair and generates its own resentment and mistrust, which often finds its way to the ballot box and not always to the best effect. Now, what are the implications of what I have said for those of us involved in education and the academy? Well, right now we are dwelling in a climate of orthodoxy, fear, and intimidation. I don't think I exaggerate here. People associated with universities do not feel free to dissent from approved opinions, that is, the progressive opinions. And orthodoxy is especially potent among students. <coughs> University students are in constant fear of being called out by their peers for sexism, racism, xenophobia, and the whole litany. They are under tremendous pressure not to utter the wrong opinions and not to associate with those who do. An example at Penn, my institution just this week is emblematic. The Penn Government and Politics Association, the undergraduate political <coughs> union, recently deplatformed an event in which I am participating next week, a panel discussion on the future of the family. Luckily, there was another organization that agreed to take it over. The mission statement of this deplatforming group, though, says the following, quote, we are devoted to nonpartisan and balanced dialogue. <laughs> we do not adopt positions on political issues. And this is the best part. We leave it to our participants to make up their own minds. <laughs> In the atmosphere of political correctness that now prevails, such a mission statement is virtually meaningless. Above all, students have learned and learned very well to plead discomfort, 
psychological harm, and offense to silence unpopular views. And they know that that ploy is powerful because it is irrefutable and unanswerable. And they know that those in authority will back them up. The university is now replete with diversity bureaucrats who stand ready to monitor attitudes and receive complaints, and of course, guard sensitivities. And all traffic in the parlance of the grievance culture, the 8,000 pound gorilla of a heckler's veto. In their quest to protect victims, they police vocabulary, identify dog whistles, tells us, tell us which terms are code for forbidden crime think, there are so many rules. Nostalgia for the 50s is hate speech. Praising Western Civ is white supremacy. And as I found out the hard way, general observations about one's classroom experience is very dangerous. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, victim groups, growing in number, have been given virtually absolute veto power over what can be said and even who can teach. In my case, I was removed from a mandatory first year course, but it needn't stop there. Many courses are essential to majors or degrees. The ban against teachers who make students uncomfortable potentially extends far beyond my situation, and I predict that in coming years it will be used more and more. But the damaging effects of the victim's absolute veto extends beyond its baleful uh, effect on free thought. It's actually bad for the students themselves. Many students don't realize that in giving in to offense and hurt and proclaiming their inability to function in the face of untowards ideas and facts, they promote and advertise their own psychological weakness. And of course, they fail to cultivate the habits of mind and heart that will serve them well in the real world. And in that vein, I recall the story of MIT scientist Nancy Hopkins who confessed that she almost fainted and lost lunch when Larry Summers suggested that men and women are not perfectly equal in cognitive ability, a proposition for which is there is actually some evidence. As a woman, I am far more offended by her response than I am by Larry Summers' suggestion. Because it feeds into every cliche, right? Women are emotional, they're weak, they cannot confront difficult ideas. And then think about the women at Google who complained that the mere presence of James Damore, author of the infamous memo about gender differences in STEM, crippled their capacity to perform on the job. And then, of course, we come back to our law students who made the same sort of claim about me. Now I find myself asking, are such people fit to lead, to exercise power, to take responsibility in a demanding competitive society? I have to conclude that they are not equipped for their future roles as leaders and professionals, and I happen to know there are many who agree with me. Yet the education they receive is not promoting the qualities they need to take their place in the world. Their betters and mentors should be encouraging a tough curiosity about all ideas, a refusal to personalize untoward facts, and a determination to hone their abilities regardless of others' op others' opinions, but they are doing the very opposite. By catering so uncritically to untutored demands and sensibilities, they infantilize their students. This cannot be called an education. It is a capitulation. And actually, you can tweet that. I want to end by asking what the present situation implies for the future, the future of our educational institutions and for our society. For educational institutions, for universities, there are now a growing number of topics for which, in effect, only a narrow range of opinion is heard. And more and more universities are taking official positions. At Penn, the university has repeatedly issued edicts and statements opposing Trump's immigration policies in all its aspects. Now, by doing this, the university, I think, renders itself irrelevant on many critical issues. And indeed, debate, truly interesting debate, has moved elsewhere to think tanks, online blogs, and private clubs. So how can we find our way back to a more vigorous understanding of what it means to operate in the marketplace of ideas, where the search for truth is valued, however halting and imperfect? At a minimum, that would require teaching students some basic precepts that are, I can tell you, not taught today. 
that honest debate is hard work, requires patience and restraint, investigation and effort, that the marketplace of ideas is not for the faint of heart, and that offense and upset, bruising thoughts, unpleasant facts, go with the territory and not, cannot be completely avoided. And on the question of identity and equality, my hope would be to revitalize some older, more traditional concepts. In a recent blog post, Andrew Sullivan put it well. Quote, liberalism has never promised equality of outcomes, merely equality of rights. It is a procedural political philosophy rooted in means, not a substantive one justified by achieving certain ends. Now in academia today, this liberalism is on life support. It is virtually extinct. In its place is a utopian egalitarian fantasy that depends on denial and the banishment of those who dare to notice reality. And of course, maintaining that fantasy requires indulging a psychology of frailty and weakness dedicated to shielding society's favored victims from facts and opinions. Because some minds seek truth and want to be free, that shielding, that protection, must ultimately rest on force, not reason. It is a pyrrhic victory for those progressives who think they are strong, in fact, they are really weak. The force needed to keep down the truth is undignified and not worthy of a free society. As citizens devoted to the integrity of our institutions, we should firmly resist that path. Thank you. Questions and comments. Yeah. Um, so I went to college in 1990 to 1994, which was uh, the time of political correctness, the culture wars, and I found it really an interesting time um, as a humanities major because a lot of those debates were happening in the context of academic disciplines and what how to define those disciplines. But what I'm seeing now is a kind of like adverse, like a, a, a questioning of the very nature of the academic enterprise, like science, for example. Uh, like that that's a that's a uh, that's a culturally loaded concept, and that if you refer to scientific truth, you're you're you're, you're taking a political position. Uh, I know you're not a scientist, but can you speak to this this two more? Uh, uh, so can you, can you speak to this sort of this this, uh, this attempt to actually get to undermine the entire thing? Well, I think it's not confined to science, although I think in, in science it's the most threatening, just a, a questioning of the whole concept of truth. It's sort of relativism run riot. Um, and that has had these collateral consequences. That's definitely a trend, but one of the uh, consequences of that is the devaluing of the importance of free speech, of uh, analytical uh, debate, of of, of give and take of ideas, that I think is definitely, uh, students are, are much less confident uh, and have far less belief in the importance of all of that. And the evidence for that is um, everywhere. There's a, a Knight Ritter poll that just came out, a uh, Gallup poll actually, that shows that, uh, and there's a gender divide here and a race divide, that a majority of students think it's more important to be nice, inclusive, and welcoming than to seek the truth. Uh, and twice as many women think that, which I find chilling. Uh, really, the last bastion of, of open debate is uh, the male, those in the male persuasion. Uh, so definitely, there has been a precipitous decline in the belief in the very existence of truth. I would add one more thing. I, um, someone just sent me an article about how they reconfigured the medical college admission test, which is now not about science, but about social justice. And it's really scary uh, to see some of these multiple choice questions. Uh, you know, what is the cause of, of women's pay gap? 
uh, they give you, you know, three options, discrimination, bigotry, natural differences between men and women. We know what the right answer is if you want to get into medical school. Yeah. Did any students or faculty members express to you, at least privately, that they applauded what you Boy, remarkably few. Uh, less than a handful. Um, the students, I, ha I teach a conservatism seminar, a conservative political and legal thought, and those students have been incredibly supportive, uh, but they were sort of on board. I mean, they are, you know, uh, people who keep their head down, and they've been persecuted, so they know what it feels like to, you know, express an opinion that is not popular. Uh, so we definitely had some solidarity there. Uh, but what is shocking to me is um, the faculty has just shunned me with a, only a few exceptions. Uh, I have received an outpouring of support in emails, letters, you know, snail mail letters, phone calls, all from ordinary people, very, very few from people within the academy. Um, How about the Penn alumni? Penn alumni have been great. Uh, uh, Paul Levy is here, and he's been a hero. He is a hero. Uh, he wrote a wonderful, uh, frank and scathing letter uh, to Amy Gutman, which you can read excerpts of in the Wall Street Journal. Um, but one of the problems is that the alumni that have supported him, and many have written uh, in his support, don't want to go on record. Um, and the reasons for that, I think, are twofold. This is my theory. One is they're terrified of being associated with someone who's been labeled a racist. I mean, people are just frightened to death of that label, and I think too frightened because it's a collective action problem if we all just sort of rebelled against that. Uh, we'd be a lot better off. And the second is what I call the little Caitlin problem. And what I mean by little Caitlin is uh, the daughters, the relatives, the offspring of all these people who want their kid to get into an Ivy League school, don't want to tick off the powers that be. And of course, here's the problem, okay? Our universities, our elite universities, have become a massive, elaborate, expensive HR department for elite jobs. And people want their kid to get in. Obviously, they want their kid to get out. But they don't really care that much about what happens while she's there. Uh, and, and I don't know what the solution to that is. These institutions, these institutions have a huge amount of power. I mean, I don't have a complete theory, but just two quick thoughts. I mean, one is, you know, as David Brooks says, the progressives really have won the culture war. They have marched through the institutions, and they have almost a complete stranglehold, progressive elites, right? Uh, and they have the power to punish people who dissent from, you know, right thinking. So that a lot of it is just fear of the, the social and the occupational and the financial consequences of being you know, thrown out of polite society. I mean, I think that's a lot of it. 
Um, and you know, I'm a tenured professor. That doesn't make me completely immune from it, but I'm, I'm relatively very protected relative to other people. And every time I talk, I get the same comment, but you have tenure. We have to keep our head down, that sort of thing. Um, so that's a problem. Um, other than that, I think that people, this, this psychologically is a color I don't see. People are imbued with this racial guilt. They just feel a tremendous amount of racial guilt. And I, you know, I am not in any way uh, minimizing the suffering of people who were slaves and what they've gone through. I mean, there have been, uh, slavery is a terrible thing, and, and there's obviously a, a lots of suffering that mankind has experienced in the past. I don't mean to, to denigrate that. But, you know, I think that we have to recognize that we, there's a limit to what we can do about that now. And I think people just so much want to make it right. They're so determined to make it right that it distorts their judgment. Yeah. Uh, I've been interested in uh, uh, Dr. Jordan Peterson's trajectory, where he, at one point, thought he might lose his license, this is not a good track for that article, and didn't know if this would stay at the University of Toronto. Now it's turned into something of a rock star. <laughs> <laughs> uh, are there any lessons we can learn about how we handle it that people like you could apply in their own situations? I mean, I don't know. I, I think, I, I mean, I don't know that much about Jordan Peterson. Uh, I'm going to learn more uh, in the near future. Um, but, you know, he's, he's a bit of more of a publicity hound than, than I am. I know that's hard to believe, but um, I think... I think that you know he he and I have taken on different quarries. I mean, he is speaking to um, I think primarily young men, uh, men who are are fairly well educated. Some of them not so educated, who uh, really feel beleaguered in our society. Masculinity is under attack. Uh, their roles are are unclear. Their place in in society is unclear. And I think that he has sort of fulfilled a need by offering them a fresh vision. Uh, so I, I wish him well in that. I'm operating within a fairly rarefied world, which is elite academia. Uh, and I, my mission here is to try to bring back some of the old civilities and values uh, and belief in truth. and. And all of that, and uh, you know, that's that's a much harder sell because the people that I'm talking to are uh, mainly have been co-opted by uh, progressive attitudes, and especially the students. The students really worry me. Um, they, uh, of course, they're going to be attracted by a set of ideas that relieve them from having to think and work hard, which I think is exactly what is going on. I mean, all the conclusions are handed to them. Uh, they know what's right. Um, I think feminism has been a, an incredibly pernicious uh, force here, radical feminism, because I see my female students dumbed down by feminist thinking, which is, we don't need to read any of those old white guys we don't need to learn what the past is about. That's a bunch of patriarchal, toxic nonsense. Uh, you know, just take it and dump it in the garbage pan. And as a result, they don't know anything. <laughs> let's take uh, one more question, okay? Yeah. Good, Amy. Can uh, two. Let's see. Roger. Uh, Amy, I, I noticed that I <laughs> 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 whether that was Penn Law School <laughs> It was sarcastic. <laughs> <laughs> well, please join me in thank you.
So welcome, so welcome to have a second glass of wine. So thank you very much for coming.